Okay, if we can get just a few more people to take their seats. Okay, we will go on to the next presentation. Before I turn this over, I just want to just make a couple comments. At last council meeting, I announced the fact that I had appointed uh, Laura Rodriguez uh, to be the director of the Office of Policy Communications and Education. She had previously been the acting director of that office uh, for uh, a number of years, and I uh, wanted to make her a permanent fixture. I, I will tell you uh, that uh, when I became director, uh, that, that area of the institute was probably the least familiar to me, um, and uh, Laura really served a very important role in helping me learn a lot about uh, those components of the institute, and I, I relied on her extensively to, and continue to, uh, to teach me and to prepare me for aspects of this new job that requires that kind of knowledge, um, and she's been a terrific partner for that. And um, so I wanted to make sure that she had a chance to be introduced to council more formally um, and to have an opportunity to present uh, updates about uh, this uh, large organization that she runs, which is part of the Office of the Director. Um, and uh, so that's why we arranged it for this council. Uh, to, as an indication of how important I think Laura is to our organization, her office sits directly next to mine. Now, that's, it's, that's a classic blessing and a curse. It's my blessing and it's her curse. Um, but um, uh, this was a good opportunity for you to hear um, about what's happening um, in this part of our organization. Laura? Okay, thank you. Um, and really, that was just his way of, of advance blaming me for anything that he does wrong in the future, since I always <laughs> told him that it was fine, not a problem. Um, so I am going to, to try to introduce a little bit today the Office of Policy, Communications, and Education, and what we, where we sit in the Institute and what we do for the Institute. Um, we're always sitting in the back of the room at these council meetings, and um, we all interact with each of you in different ways and to different extents. Um, but I think our function within the Institute and why we're always sitting in the back of the room may not have been clear um, before. So hopefully after this it will be. And hopefully my real goal um, is to hopefully identify some areas that you're interested in and encourage um, more interaction between my group and you all as council, um, both for um, the benefit that I know we will gain from having direct interaction with you all, but hopefully we'll be able to be helpful to you as well. So we're going to just really talk about the who, the what, and the why a little bit and try to go through it um, relatively quickly. Um, we sit within the office of the director um, within the institute from an organizational standpoint, but what we do really reaches across the research portfolio, both in the intramural program and in the extramural program, um, with a direct connection to science being the base for everything that we are doing and the, and the research that is happening um, in genomics, both funded by NHGRI and also that that's funded out there um, by others and being accomplished by others because we are tracking the field as a whole to stay on top of it um, for the institute. We are made up of four individual branches, um, a policy and program analysis branch, communications and public liaison, education and community involvement, and genomic healthcare. And we usually refer to ourselves by our acronyms. So if I slip into that, please forgive me. I'm trying not to today um, so that you can actually know what we're doing. And there are um, many people that make up these branches. And I'm going to go through what they do very quickly and, and not have time to cover in depth um, the real breadth of things that they work on day to day and um, the work that they do. But we're a relatively small office to conduct all the different activities that are going to be covered. Um, within our scope, and um, my staff is incredibly dedicated and committed um, to the work of the genome and to the work that they need to do for each of their individual missions. As I mentioned already, the, the aim here of everything that we do is to move forward from the research as our base, um, to be informed by that research, to conduct policy development, um, policy mediation in some cases, and outreach activities to the various stakeholders that we have and ideally feed that back into the research process um, to either help in the best case scenario or to at least get feedback on what isn't working so that we can go back and try to redress that um, through new policy activities or new outreach activities going forward. Um, as Eric mentioned, there are many people that make up this um, group. I've put all of their pictures here because we didn't have time to do the tag team kind of um, presentation that I would have liked to to let each of the groups talk about the things that they're doing um, and there will not be a quiz on all of the names later for the people in the back of the room and I'll try to show their pictures again um, in a bigger format as we go through. 
So our primary function really is to get the message of the Institute out about the research and about what we're doing um, to try and bring genomics um, to the improvement of healthcare options. We do that in various ways. Um, most of what we do spends a lot of time in meetings. We're building relationships, we're talking to people, and we're writing a lot of documents to get the stories out there and to get our messages and our positions um, into the conversation, whether it's an internal government conversation, out to stakeholders, out to students, whomever it might be that we're interacting with at, this um, at a particular time. Our various audiences, of course, um, begin with the research community itself. Um, but it extends to healthcare practitioners, of course, Congress, the White House, the department. Um, we need to consider them our audiences as well, since they directly um, control what we do and how much, um, how many resources we have to do it with them. So we want to make sure they understand where we're going. Um, we take our education mission very seriously, so we interact a lot and have a lot of activities targeted to students and to um, teachers and professors, and of course the general public, um, who is the ultimate benefactor of all of the research that we do and someone that it's very important that um, we have a good relationship with from a standpoint of public trust to support the research enterprise as a whole, um, but also so that they can begin to understand and appreciate what genomics will be able to do for them in their lifetimes and for their children. And then the media, of course, because they are um, a further megaphone for all of our stories going out and it's important that they understand what we're doing and that, that we have a good relationship with them. Audiences also equal potential partners. I'm not going to go through all of them here, but just as a representative, of course, for researchers, for example, we work a lot with um, groups such as ASHG. Joe Boffman is here very loyally every time our council gathers, and we also talk to her in between, um, and as well as other professional organizations to make sure that we're trying to stay as in touch as possible with the investigator community um, to know what, what is happening, what challenges you all are facing, and what we might be able to do to help. And of course, then with the public, where we um, work with the Genetic Alliance, again with the media, as well as other advocacy groups, such as the National Congress for American Indians, who we have a partnership right now with um, trying to go forward, um, as they have issues with genetics and genomics research and trying to bring them into partnership with what the goals are. Um, and of course, all of the interactions with various federal agencies. Again, going back to the fact that NHGRI is a relatively small institute and our office is relatively small, we operate um, probably 80% by leveraging our resources and forming partnerships with others, um, tag teaming onto places um, where they have activity um, because a lot of what we're interested in doing in bringing genomics into healthcare, we don't actually have any purview over because we are a research organization. And so to be able to get to the back end um, or downstream activities necessary, we need to form partnerships with groups um, such as the FDA and ARC, for instance. So talking first now about our policy and program analysis, again, here's the staff. Um, Derek, as Eric mentioned, has recently come on board. We're going to show his picture as many times as possible today um, to make sure that his, his, the image of his face becomes burned into your mind and you know that, that he's someone you can talk to. Um, and the kinds of things that, that this group focuses on for the most part, but it really can be quite a broad array of activities, is um, legislative liaison activities, basic government relations kinds of work, representing the institute um, to the NIH, to the department, to the White House as necessary, um, interacting with our scientists to make sure that we know what's happening in our research portfolio, reporting on that portfolio to the NIH and to others um, and to Congress so that we can justify the spending that we have, and of course interacting with the public to make sure um, that our policies that are going forward and how we're conducting our research um, is responsible and is um, meritorious of the public's trust. Um, Eric already mentioned, this is mostly his slide from before, that we track appropriations, we track other pieces of legislation. Um, we were very involved in GINA before. But in addition to that, we also have a responsibility um, as part of the administration um, to work with Congress and to provide understanding um, and to help them from a technical perspective to know what we're doing and what our research is doing. And so we try and build relationships, and those are very important to NIH and to us as an institute. Um, so that there is understanding and appreciation for the kinds of things that we're trying to do. And so we think a lot about um, who these relationships are with and making sure that we are available to them. One of the issues that NIH is facing generally is the fact that many of our previous um, champions um, have either passed away or retired. And so um, NIH in general is facing 
um, the problem of needing to build new relationships to Senator Tom Harkin is one of the major ones um, that still is part of the leadership structure for our appropriations and our authorizing committees. And many of you probably know this, but there are two different structures. Eric alluded to it and to how things are going to happen for NCATS and for the CURES um, network going forward in that appropriations controls our money. Obviously, we care a great deal about them. I've shown here the leadership for both the full committee and the subcommittees, um, but also our authorizing committees are very important because they are the ones that give us permission to try to do the things that we want to do. Um, and we do need to have permission almost all of the time before appropriations will give us money to do it. Um, it's not a perfect system, and sometimes appropriators just will things to happen. But in general, it's best to have your authorizers on your side and to make sure that they understand um, what we're doing. In addition, we try to look to other members of Congress, of course, our Maryland delegation. Um, there are many others within the Maryland delegation that um, we also talk to. That I've just listed those with direct um, relevance to NIH as a constituent. Um, but certainly with the number of workers employed at um, NIH that live in other parts of the state, um, there's a, a wide array of people that are following us from the delegation. And I've also shown, again, just a sampling of other people who have expressed an interest in genetics and whom we're trying to talk to, again, to try to build up um, a stronger relationship with them as they're newer to leadership positions or newer to um, positions where they might um, need to understand more about NIH than they may have in the past. And so we want to make sure that we're available to them and to their staff um, so that they don't have questions or they don't have um, any misunderstandings with what we're trying to do. Some quick updates with other things within the policy realm that, have, that we track for the Institute. Um, the stem cell funding um, had some news since the last council. So Judge Lambert, who had previously, I guess about last August, issued an injunction against the NIH to prevent us from doing stem cell research. Um, that injunction was later reversed, and so the NIH was continuing. But he now revisited his decision and made a summary decision to, to state that the NIH was not in violation of the legislative prohibi prohibition um, that we were being, um, I guess not accused, that sounds a little bit antagonistic, but they were stipulating um, that we were doing, which had to do with the um, creation or destruction of embryos. There were two scientists who were adult stem cell researchers um, who were saying that the funding of embryonic stem cell research was preventing them from obtaining um, the resources they needed. And Judge Lambert ruled in such a way that the NIH can continue to go forward as we have been doing and um, also issued his ruling such that appeals are not likely to happen so we should move on from this issue for now. Also in the courts, um, there was another ruling in the ongoing series of activity with regard to the Myriad suit over the BRCA1 and 2 patent. Um, this is a picture of Neil Katyal, who was the acting solicitor general um, back in the spring when the, um, the suit moved to the Federal Circuit of Appeals. And the Department of Justice actually took such an interest in this case, and not only did they issue a brief, but the acting solicitor general argued um, for the case. And this was quite a statement in terms of um, the government's position with regard to the fact that they were now stating that um, isolated DNA they felt was not patent eligible. Unfortunately, the decision that came down from the courts was that they, in a two to one ruling, that they did think that isolated DNA was patent eligible. Um, there was another decision um, which agreed with the Department of Justice's position that cDNA is patent eligible. And the court also found that in a unanimous decision that the methods claim that associated the genotype to the phenotype as described in the Myriad patent was invalid, but it was invalid as written, um, and which leaves a lot of room um, for it to be appealed or for people to write their claims in the future in a way that would not be considered to be invalid. Um, at this point, appeals have been filed again um, from both sides, so this is going to go forward. It's not clear yet whether it will be heard by the full panel of the Federal Circuit of Appeals. Um, this ruling came down from just a subpanel of three of the judges. Um, and so it may be heard by all 10 that sit on the bench, or it may be taken up by the Supreme Court. And we are waiting to find out what that, will, what that decision will be. Um, other things that policy covers, don't worry, I'm not going to go through this again. This is what I generally talk to you all about. Um, but we do try to develop new policy um, 
new policies for the agency, new policy positions that promote genomics research. And data sharing, of course, has been a major subject over the past few years, and our institute um, has played a leadership role across the agency in moving these forward. Something that's coming up more recently in July, as I'm sure many of you know, the government put forward an advance notice for proposed rulemaking to update the common rule which governs human subjects research. Um, and there are many, many sweeping changes um, in this ANPRM that is currently out for public comment until the end of October. Um, but there are several that have direct relationship um, to genomics. And in particular is the fact that there's a statement now that genetic samples um, should be considered inherently identifiable, but one of the new themes that is introduced through this ANPRM is that um, the way that risk should be overseen within our oversight system is based on a risk classification scheme. So while it deems that genomics, genomic data and biospecimens are identifiable, it classifies them as really having informational risk associated with them, which would just call into place new standards for data privacy and data security. Um, so there are a lot of questions out there about what exactly this means and how it's going to be interpreted, and Pearl's making faces at me at the moment. Um, again, other things that will go forward is that the data security protections are calibrated to identifiability. This concept of, of risk classification and calibration of risk um, to the oversight measures in place is something that's been talked about for a long time. So in general, it's a good thing, but the devil is definitely in the details of how to do this. Um, another thing that will be important for our community is that um, because of this, again, determination that genetic samples are identifiable, there's also an assertion that written consent should be required for all uses of existing research samples. Um, it does have a clause in there to allow grandfathering in of existing samples at the time that the rule would go into a place, but going forward it would expect that there would be written consent for every tissue collection if it were to be used for research, and that is drastically different than the way most of our collections um, come into genomics research today. Moving on to genomic healthcare. This is um, our newest branch. It was created in 2007. It is also our smallest branch. Um, it is ably staffed by Greg Firo and Jean Jenkins, who are both technically part-time and both work more than full-time hours, I think, going forward. Um, but it really was a recognition um, that it was time to, to look at the needs of providers in terms of readiness for genomics to come into the clinic um, if we were to be successful with improving patient outcomes. And this branch in particular has worked very closely with its various partners and stakeholders, um, and I've shown them here below, just to remind us that that's really always where our base comes from, but they have partnered very heavily with um, different parts of the government as well as with different professional organizations. Another update from things that have been happening that normally Eric would have talked about, um, we've talked before about this series that is co-edited by Greg Firo and Alan Guttmacher. Um, in the New England Journal of Medicine on genomic medicine, and the eighth and ninth publications in this series came out um, since our May Council going forward um, on the genomics of the eye and microbial genomics. This um, series continues to receive very positive feedback um, going forward, and there are a few articles left in the series um, before it concludes. One of the things, um, like all things genome, that genomic healthcare does is to build resources and community resource tools. And one of the things that they've put a lot of their effort into has been the Family um, Health History Project to build a tool for family history um, in partnership with the Surgeon General and in the last few years in partnership a great deal with the, Na the um, National Cancer Institute to have this going so that there's a tool that's available online for members of the public to go in and create a family history with their individual family um, health history recorded, they can print it out, they can take it to their doctor, and they can talk to their doctor about it. Um, and they have been working to update this to make the make it interoper interoperable with other electronic health record, <coughs> excuse me, information, um, and also to begin to create risk al algorithms for certain diseases. So at the moment, um, they are working on one for colon cancer, and there is one for cardiovascular history, I believe, that ClinSeq has been using um, going forward. In addition, again, going back to their education um, mission within the branch, they're creating resources for curricula development for the various health practitioners. 
um, working in partnership with those um, health practitioner organizations and professional organizations at the moment. This um, relatively new web-based resource, the Genetics and Genomics Competency Center for Education, has curricula and educational materials posted for genetic counselors, for nurses and physician assistants um, going forward, and we are always looking to add new disciplines to this. We have a meeting coming up this fall to begin talking to the pharmacist community. Um, where we have invited 14 of their many professional organizations to come in and have a, a very work-oriented um, small group discussion around what the needs are within the pharmacist community around genomics and how we can begin to move that and develop um, professional, I mean, educational materials and perhaps post that into G2C2 over time. Um, another update just to let you all know about is that Greg and Eric have recently published um, an article in JAMA in their special education issue around um, the health needs and um, for educating health practitioners um, to bring about genomic medicine. And in this, they have um, made arguments for the fact that we need to build an evidence base for genomics medicine, that that's going to be important, that we um, also need to have genomics um, educational material for non-genetics health professionals, as this is going to be something that's going to um, be disseminated across the health scheme. And also that we need to have increased um, efficiencies in how we're using um, health information technology. And again, that's nothing new um, to these conversations or to many of the other conversations that um, we have had around the Institute about um, translating genomics into the clinical setting. We also um, support, as an institute, the Institute of Medicine's Genomics Roundtable, which has been meeting for um, about four years on different issues around bringing genomics into clinical care. Greg Farrell currently sits on that roundtable, as does Jeff, Jeff Ginsburg. Um, and the most recent workshop, we've updated you from time to time on workshops, was on integrating large-scale genomic information into clinical practice. And it was a very popular meeting, very well attended. Um, and the, work, the workshops of the group have continued to be increasingly relevant, and the group itself has continued um, with the dissolution of the Secretary's Advisory Committee to play an increasingly important role in providing a forum for discussion about policy issues around genomics. Our Education and Community Involvement Branch um, has, a, again, a, a dual mission, much as genomic healthcare was looking at integrating genomics um, into clinical care as well as an education mission. Here we have an education mission both um, leveled at the K through 12 and undergraduate um, communities as well as community organizations themselves and members of the public. And um, this Venn diagram is something that Vince Bonham has put together with his group, which explains how things different, how their various missions and activities overlap together. Um, they again are interacting with several different forms different um, members of our stakeholder groups, from um, teachers and professors to members of the general public, as well as community-based organizations. One of the things that Vince has been particularly involved with himself is the, putting, is the um, organization of a very targeted small workshop on um, studying sickle cell disease that will take place this December. Um, it will take place one day before in conjunction with the hematology meeting so that we have many of the experts together. So this will happen in San Diego. Um, it is sponsored, as many things are that we do, with um, several other institutes so that we can bring the various disease-based institutes together around our um, tool building genomics science. And we have um, several members of the um, community involved as external co-chairs, and I know there are a lot of the agenda for this meeting looks very exciting, and um, we expect good things to come from their discussion um, to move the treatment options and using genomic strategies for treatment options forward. Um, I've mentioned that one of the, the missions for ECIB is to work with communities, and so also to highlight the fact that we try and work together across um, our branches, I wanted to show you the number of different translations that ECIB um, had worked with to take the family health history tool and translate that um, to other languages so that it can be useful to um, all sectors of our population. And also, as I mentioned, we've done, we have a new partnership that's going forward with the National Congress of American Indians 
um, to help them put together a resource for their community on human subjects research. And we've done work in the past in that same general area with the South Central Foundation from Alaska. Um, many of you, hopefully all of you, are familiar with the education outreach activities, in particular DNA Day, that our um, education branch puts together. We also have a genomics careers resource, which could hopefully be something that's a useful resource to you all with your students. Um, and we've talked many times about the talking glossary that was recently updated and released. And now the Spanish version of that talking glossary um, will be coming out this October, and we wanted to let you all know about that. Um, in addition to the fact that as of this morning, our new iPhone app for the Talking Glossary is available so that um, students um, and others that have iPhones can make sure to have handy any definition that they might need or an illustration um, to explain some complicated genetics factoid as they're going on the run. Um, so through the iPhone app, you can see all of the information that's available through the web, the illustrations, the 3D images, as well as the audio descriptions of the definition so that it's not just written and it's a very interactive tool um, as well as it is on the web. Are these all done by Eric or is, it a, is there a, a voice that's easier to understand? Because this St. Louis accent is pretty strong. These are not all done by Eric. Um, so we went around to, to many different people and so um, and actually, we have several iPhones that are here and have this now loaded on for anybody that wants to play with it at the break. Um, we can use this if it's optimized for the iTouch. Again, thinking about who the user population will be um, for this. It's, it works on the iPad, but not as well. But certainly, um, that's something we'll look at as iPads continue to be, um, become a great educational resource and more and more schools are getting them for use in the classrooms. Another annual event, just to let you know, that took place over the summer was the um, summer workshop in genomics where the education branch brings in um, professors from various um, undergraduate institutions um, from around the country for an intensive week of genomics learning. Um, oftentimes, this short course, as we um, call it, includes students as well as professors. But this year, it was limited to professors for various reasons. And it had 33 participants, as is on the slide, from a range um, of states and um, as well as Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And they heard from, I believe, over 20 of our intramural faculty members. They had an intensive bioinformatics um, workshop during the day. Um, Eric told him their li his life story at one point during the week. Um, so all in all, they, they seem to have a very um, good experience. One of the, the exciting things that happened this year was that the group divided into three different working groups, and they worked with one dedicated faculty member before, during, and after the short course to put together an educational resource that everyone could take home and use um, in their classrooms during the year. And that was a very positive experience, both for the intramural investigators that helped them, as well as for all of the faculty members to come together. Um, a report that came out just about 10 days ago with um, Michael Doherty from ASHG as its first author began looking at the issue of, um, not began, was looking at the issue of, of K-12 um, genetics education and looking at it in the, with the lens of standards-based education as our education system moves more and more towards this standards-based measurement. And what they found, I think not surprisingly to many of us, is that the um, adequacy of the genetics education across the country is really um, below where we want it to be if we're going to have a, citizen sh a citizenry in the future that is able to be an informed partner in the decision making around their health care. Um, and I listed some of the stats here, but this is really all moving towards this concept of genetic literacy and genomic literacy and what exactly does that mean and how can we um, promote that. And the education branch is putting on a workshop again this fall where they are going to work with experts from a variety of fields to look at several different case studies where they have done some community conversations in particular um, communities around genomics to bring that information from those community conversations back into this two-day workshop and to really examine what we've learned from those conversations and where we need to go going forward if we are um, to help facilitate and promote a genomically literate um, public. Our last branch is the Communications and Public Liaison Branch. Um, 
They, of course, work with the media and with the public and are really the voice of the Institute in terms of projecting out our messages. Um, they provide the public face to the Institute through our website, of course, but also through our press releases of various research that comes out both intramurally and extramurally. Um, and recently, through a partnership with the policy branch, have started taking those um, pieces of research news and trying to um, package them and make them accessible to the general public by writing more lay-friendly, lay-language versions of these research updates and putting them out. And again, Eric has updated you in the past on these genome advances that began in February, and these are the um, advances that have come out since that time. Um, I get looking in May at the using genomic strategies for public health problem around the E. coli break, um, outbreak in Germany, um, then taking on whole genome sequencing um, for individual clinical care with the case um, from Baylor where whole genome sequencing was used in twins to improve their outcomes, and then the research discovery from our own intramural program around Proteus that Eric talked about in more detail in his talk. One of the things that's important for us to do beyond our press releases and our standard web pages is to begin trying to market um, our messages and our stories to an increasing sector of the public and to disseminate NHGRI news and other news from genomics in general to as wide of um, variety as possible. And so we've been looking for new ways to do that that are interactive. And one of the things that we've done is to create a video studio in our office suite. So we've taken a regular office and converted it to a green screen room. And this is a picture from the first um, time that we used this, where Jim Mulliken had an exciting story on Neanderthal evolution. And this is a control room, which is a few offices down the hall, where we can put the magic together and make it look like Jim is talking in his lab. Um, if you go back and, and look here, actually, you see that Alvaro, um, our video technician on one of the things, I think it's who's Model C, but he's actually now making it look like Eric is in Africa for something recent for the H3 Africa meeting that's coming up that Eric can't attend. So we're trying to use this as, as much as we can um, and to, again, make sure that we have story ready and, and ready to go for any media outlet that might want to use it. And also, we are putting it on YouTube. Again, trying to reach out to our audiences where they are. Um, YouTube has a much larger number of, of unique visitors than our website does. And so we have over 180 videos posted at this point on YouTube, which are getting a large number of hits. And as you can see, we did a telebriefing on the Proteus story that came out a few months ago. And we put the video of that telebriefing up on YouTube so that people could go and watch it as well. We're also moving into social media now. And so we have a presence on Facebook. We started with DNA Day in 2009. And now we have a genome page um, that was launched just a few months ago. At this point, we're starting to pick up a following. So we have 567 likes um, for genome and more than 4,000 um, for DNA Day, since both conversations run throughout the year. So we really use DNA Day as an ongoing conversation with um, the um, student community, and you can see what well, you can't see, but but what's shown on here is um, some some discussion about the recent ASA paper from um, Mike Doherty at ASHG. That map that's shown up there is the one that shows which states are adequate and not adequate in terms of their genetic standards. And there's some conversation from someone in Kansas talking about what her experience was, and then from the um, NHGRI page, there's someone ask, asking how to get access to certain data and um, our communication staff responding to them, pointing them in the right direction. So this is um, being helpful and we hope it will become um, more and more utilized and something that we can, can use. We put all of our stories now um, up on Facebook. We also are using Twitter to try and get the news out about what's happening. Again, we have a Twitter feed for both um, DNA Day and for NHGRI. Um, current stats just in terms of, of what's happening. Um, recently, we posted a video from Betty Graham um, giving a talk about how to obtain a grant. And if I remember my stats right, which I'm not going to, I believe it had over um, 500 hits in the last few weeks um, going forward. And also the news about Mark's appointment and Jim Mulliken's appointment um, had about 200 hits going forward. So this we're actually finding is getting us more at least equivalent, if not more, coverage than our traditional press releases would. And we're getting it out to a variety of audiences. And so the dissemination is much broader than our, our traditional pathways. 
So this brings us back then to what we're trying to do, where we're using, again, the research as the base for everything that we do in terms of policy and outreach, engaging in dialogue with you all, with other members of the community, um, to find out what's important, where the challenges are, how we can be helpful, what we need to address in our day-to-day -day jobs. And really, this comes down then to finding the different issues as they come up, where are the opportunities, where are the needs, so that we can make sure that genomics research can go forward and bring about all the benefit and potential that we know that it has. And with that, I will stop and just put up all of my staff again, since it's really all of them that do the work and several of the slides. So thank you. Questions for Laura? Laura? Um, Laura, it's my understanding that uh, genomics at CDC is being scaled back or has been substantially scaled back. Are there, is there any possibility that some of the activities that they were involved in, like EGAP, I don't know what's going to happen to those activities and whether your office would become more involved in any of those things? So we met with Muin at least once in the spring after news of this came, came forward to talk about what was happening and what he thought was going to happen to the programs that he had currently funded and to those that he was trying to start. Um, I know he was also doing those same kinds of visits with other institutes and with other parts um, of the genomics community. There's actually a meeting on Wednesday to talk about the future of public health genomics. There was a request for information with several questions put out to the community at large for public comment. Um, and there are four or five of us going to that meeting on Wednesday to listen to the discussion and participate in the discussion so we can answer just your question going forward. Laura, thanks so much. Um, a question I have is uh, using the advance notice of proposed rulemaking as an example, which is going to have huge ramifications for researchers, you know, saying that all tissue is identifiable, this concept of a consent, how do we track that? There are a lot of issues. It, does your office, as part of its role to sort of get out to your investigators, these are potential impacts of this for genetic researchers? Or are you too close to the people who wrote it that you can't do that? Because what we're here, we're having a really hard time getting our investigators engaged. And all they hear is, you know, less bureaucracy, let's go right. for it. But then you say, well, who's going to get these consents and who's going to track it? There's, it's the, you know, the other what ifs. But do you have a, does your office have a role in that? Or I not? think my office has a role in that. I personally have a great interest in many of the questions that are coming out of that. Um, we will not comment officially on um, the ANPRM or on other iterations as it has come forward in terms of a public perspective. We've already commented on the draft before it went out internally and will continue to be involved. There's a committee set up for NIH. Um, with all of the institutes represented to inform Building 1 as this conversation goes forward. But from the perspective of talking to the investigators, I think that's fundamental to what we're doing and for us to be able to do our job well. Um, we're having a conversation. I'm, I'm putting together a panel on this at the um, LC Sears PI meeting in a few weeks to talk to that group about it. Um, I'm also hoping that down the road there are um, consortia, which you all are going to talk about in closed session around our new sequencing programs and our new sequencing RFAs, and I'm hoping that, again, those will be groups that we can go to to interact with around what exactly are the issues as this conversation goes forward, because the ANPRM, as you know, is going to take a long time to move forward, and there will probably be several iterations, and so we're going to need to have an ongoing dialogue with the investigators and their institutions, because as you said, a lot of times it may be the institutions that are engaged more in these regulatory discussions going forward. Okay. They're going to go up on the web. Yeah, it'll, well, on their site, but, or that maybe they're even on the public website in addition. Both, Both, I guess. yeah, <laughs> readily, yes. You have access to all these slides. I hope people, let me just add a couple comments. First of all, I, I hope by seeing this presentation, you can appreciate the breadth of things that Laura and her team are responsible for. I mean, it's just sometimes mind boggling how many different, you know, responsibilities fall within it. It also, therefore, is not surprising that this is a lot of effort. Cornell, oftentimes, Laura and I are exchanging email like 4.30 and 5 in the morning kind of thing, because there's so many, there's so many things that all these things relate to um, that re require our attention. 
Um, one thing I would drill down a little bit more and point out, because Laura stressed this whole thing about these YouTube postings and, and this commitment to video as a modality for outreach, if you will. I really have been uh, struck when I've traveled internationally. I mean, all this stuff goes up on YouTube. Occasionally I hear people look at it. When I travel internationally, I can think just in the last year to South America, to Africa, and then to India, I was struck at how many people come up to me and talk to me about the various things they're watching that we're posting on YouTube. So while they may not have access to a lot of seminar speakers in genomics or experts in the field to come through their particular institutions, you know, not only is it stuff that we're putting up from the green room and the stuff that we're making specifically for posting, but we're trying to take a lot of our symposium and our lecture series and our tutorials and increasingly put them up as well as an outreach. And they really are appreciated by folks in, uh, around the world and they're watching them. So I think that's the justification for the investment <laughs> we're making for that. Yep. I just had an interesting question. How, in the media world at large, how is it perceived, and I'm assuming that this must be done all over the place, for um, a, a presentation or a report or whatever it is coming from a center that it's not, coming from a site that it's at, not actually at. In other words, you're using the green room, uh, but it's in the lab or it's in Africa or something like that. So from the public who's watching this, how do they perceive that? They they don't know. I think it happens all the time on the I'm news sure that we does. watch and, and, you know, where we go just simply because people can't travel to where they need to be. And so, you know, they'll look like they're in Washington mm -hmm. and they might be somewhere else. Right. But does so, that need to in any and, way be noted by someone? So, and Larry, somebody? our communications director is going well, to While Larry's coming to the microphone, they, they we don't go to extremes. For example, during the hurricane, I wanted to do a thing where they were going to be blowing water and wind <laughs> on me and a live reporting in the green room. They wouldn't let me do it. But go ahead, Larry. Well, it would have wrecked the equipment, so, you know, that was totally out. Um, I mean, is your question actually about are, do, will people perceive that they're being fooled by where the person is? So our, certainly our intention is not to fool anybody. And I don't and, and most of the time when, you know, a person is not in the location, um, it, we make it fairly obvious that this is intended to be a pretty picture and it's visual and it's not intended to be tricking you in any way. The stuff with the lab, th um, that was actually Jim's lab and it was more, the, the green room has been set up, the green screen studio has been set up to make it uh, uh, efficient uh, essentially. So we try to make it as realistic as possible and as authentic as possible, but we're not, but, but we're also, we're a very small group and it takes a lot of effort to do video. So it's much easier to have the cameras stationary, bring in the people, sit them in a place and put up a photograph behind them. And we're going to be doing that with some you know, regularity, but it's, we'll, we'll be experimenting with it. And I, I hear the question that you're asking, um, there is a balance between being extremely concrete and being, you know, and, and lying. And we're going to definitely stay away from the lying side, but not always be concrete in that sometimes we'll just be putting up pretty pictures and you'll be able to tell it's a pretty picture, not necessarily where the guy was or the gal was. Yeah. Just a brief follow up, but journalists have been fired for this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> journalist, so, <laughs> I, I'm a former journalist so, so and I'm a I. former broadcaster and we use green screen all the time. I've, I've done so many stand-ups in front of the Capitol building when the Capitol building was not behind me and I was standing in a studio. And nobody's fooled by that. Everybody knows that, it's a, that, that you're in a studio. So I'm nope. not a journalist and I never was. But um, I, I have to say that, you know, having Jim's lab behind him, I, I find fairly benign. But having a shot of Africa. No, 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 we should might... we should clarify this. Everything. No, it, it's a graphic. It is not portraying me or anyone uh, being. It was just simply. It was it's decoration, really. It's oh, decoration. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. It was just simply oh, okay. instead of just showing a blank wall, it didn't portray me to be someone Thank I was not. Thank you for the clarification. It was just to bring Eric. in the theme of where this was going to show. Thank that you I think for it's the like a website, the H3 Africa website behind me, simply showing then, my. Then I don't yeah. think any of us would object yeah, yeah. to this that. Yeah, yeah. This was not a misleading. This was more of like that wasn't clear. thematic. That I'm wasn't sorry. clear. Uh, <laughs> there might have been, but I haven't seen that part of the clip. It's actually an interesting cultural question, and, and it maybe it's something that we'll need to sort of sort out as we go through it with this. Uh, uh, but over the years, I've come to recognize that my scientific colleagues are extremely concrete, and what they see is exactly what they believe is actually there. And on the artistic side, yeah, you do some interpretation with this kind of stuff. So I, there may be some issue with where that comfort zone comes, and we would certainly welcome input and feedback about that, and I'm sure we'll get some. 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> Wait, 3D yet, yeah, but that's, that's coming. <laughs> okay, thank you, Laura. So 